Moving on, we can talk about Robert Millikan. Robert Millikan, he found the charge of an electron. He was working in 1908 at the University of Chicago, and you know what? He designed his own experimental setup here. We're going to talk about it in just a little bit. This is called Millikan's Oil Drop Experiment. He started with this canister. And the canister is filled with air. It is not a vacuum. But the air inside is of uniform pressure. And if there's uniform pressure, that means that there is no air movement. And you'll see in a moment why that's important. Now in this upper chamber, we have an atomizer. And I know you think that an atomizer is some sort of gee whiz alien weapon, but it's not. It's a fancy name for a squeeze bottle. In the atomizer, he put an oil. And he squeezed it out. And when he squeezed it out, the atomizer created this fine mist of oil. Now, he also used a capacitor. Remember, we talked about a capacitor back when we were talking about J.J. Thompson. A capacitor is, again, a device that is used to create a uniform electric field across a given plane. So we have the positive plate of the capacitor here and the negative plate of the capacitor here. And we have our power source, either a battery or another source of electricity. He also used x-rays here. And the x-rays were used to give the oil droplets a little bit of a negative charge. Now, at the top, in the top plate, the positive plate of the capacitor, you can see there's a small hole. And that small hole allowed some of those oil droplets to fall through. So here's the experiment. He was able to use the telescope to make these small measurements and to measure the velocity of an oil droplet. And what he found, using basic physics, is that there is a downward force acting on the oil droplet. And that downward force is equal to the mass of the oil droplet multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. But he went a step further. He used the x-rays to give the oil a negative charge. And then he used the capacitor to create a uniform electric field. And he was able to manipulate the electric field so that instead of the oil droplet just falling slowly down, he eventually got the oil droplet to go back up because the oil droplet's negative in charge and it would be attracted to the positive plate. So it was going up. And he played with it. And he kept playing with it. I've actually done this experiment. It's actually hard to do. It's really hard to do. You actually move this oil droplet up and down until eventually your goal is to get that oil droplet just to maintain its position in space. It stays right there in the air column. Still. Now, in order for the oil droplet to stay still, force one acting down must have been equaled by another force going up. We'll call that F2, force number two. So F1 must be equal to F2 for that oil droplet to stay centered. Now, we found out that F2 is equivalent to Q. Q is the charge of the oil droplet multiplied by E, the intensity of the electric field. So let's play around with a little bit of mathematics here, analyze this equation. Look what we can find. If we were to take the mass, multiply it by gravity, remember that equals F1. And we take F1 and equal that to F2, which is equal to the charge, Q, of the oil droplet, and E, the intensity of the electric field. Doing a little mathematics, we divide Mg by E, and what do we find? Mg divided by E equals the charge of the oil droplets. That's cool, right? I'm going to put a cool squiggly thing around. Awesome, we found the charge of the oil droplet. But we didn't find the charge of the electron. 
because this is why. We've got little oil droplets. We've got little teeny oil droplets. We've got large size oil droplets. We've got droplets that are in between, right? We've got oil droplets of all different sizes. There's no way for us to control the size of the oil droplet. But what Millikan found was that the size of the oil droplet was a function of the charge of the oil droplet. So the bigger the oil droplet, the more electrons it was able to capture, and the higher the negative electric field, or I'm sorry, the negative electric charge. And so what he found was that the charge can actually be found as a number of ratios. And he used this ratio to eventually find the charge of the electron. So what he was able to conclude is that the charge of the electron is actually negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Now anytime you guys see a number that says times 10 to the negative 19, that is an extremely small number. All right, the charge of an electron is very, very small. Now coulombs, coulombs, that's a unit for charge, for charge. And those are Millikan's findings, okay? Millikan's findings. I hope that's helpful. A little bit complicated. If you have any questions, ask me in class and we can talk about it again. You've been sitting here listening to me talk about chemistry. You need a cute break. So here's a bulldog in a swing. Moving on. Albert Einstein, my favorite guy. Okay, I love this guy. A great picture right there. Never take yourself too seriously. I think that's what we learned from this picture. He was working in 1905, University of Zurich. And he was, uh, he was looking at the photoelectric effect. Now, the photoelectric effect was known. It was known about before Einstein. And basically what it is, is that you have this material, whatever it might be. It could be a metal. It could be a non-metal. could be a metalloid. We'll learn about those a little bit later. It could, be, it could be any kind of material. And when you bombard that material with light energy, this is light energy, then the light energy comes in, it interacts with the electrons in that material somehow, and it actually ejects the electrons back out. So we have these ejected Electrons. Get it? So up until uh, Einstein came onto the block, it was thought that light only came in this wave-like nature. And it's true. Light can be described as a wave. But Einstein said, wait a second. For the photoelectric effect to work, there must be some sort of particle-to-particle -particle interaction between the light waves and the electrons, because the electrons are particles. So for that to happen, light should also be what he would later call quantized. Quantized. He, does, he described light as these measurable, quantized, particles called photons. We call these photons today. So, not only can a not only can light be described as a wave, but it can also be described as packets or particles. We call these photons. He also said that the higher the intensity of the light then the higher the average energy of the emitted electrons. So if I, have a, if I have some light energy that is of extremely high energy, the electrons are going to be ejected at very high energy. If I've got lower electron, um, light, if I've got lower energy light, then the average energy of the emitted electron will be lower. So we would say that uh, Einstein was instrumental in describing the dual nature or the duality of light. Light can be described as a wave, but it can also be described as particles. And those were Einstein's findings. 
Now this was webcast number one for unit one honors chemistry. I hope it was uh, helpful. Again, I just started doing these webcasts, so if you guys could give me some constructive criticism, how I might change them, how I might make them look better, it would be a huge help. Thank you very much. This is Underwood, signing out.